Hi, thank you for joining us today. We're really happy to spend some time with you to explain and bring out publicly what we've been building towards to. Um, and that's what we call the SecOps cloud platform. We think it's a really exciting uh, new type of platform, new type of capability. It's something that's going to have a pretty large impact foundationally on the industry and how a lot of people do cybersecurity and build in cybersecurity. So what's the agenda? Very briefly, we will begin by explaining what is the SecOps cloud platform. So we'll go into why we think it's needed, um, what does it look like, what are the advantages, really explain it a lot more. We will then be talking uh, to folks that are in enterprise. So uh, we will have a panel uh, around enterprise and around the impact that the SecOps cloud platform has within enterprise and CISOs and security. We then have a MSSP and incident response panel. So people that do incident response, people that are uh, managed cybersecurity service providers that do these services day in, day out, and the type of impact that this type of solution has for them. We'll talk to builders. So those are people that are building products and solutions in cybersecurity um, and that are building and they're looking for different types of acceleration and innovation in what they're doing. And so how this SecOps Cloud Platform influences how they can do things. Finally, there's the ecosystem discussion. So this will be a discussion with people in cybersecurity from different areas of cybersecurity that do different, uh, different types of cutting edge uh, products and companies and the type of impact this, uh, this will have on the rest of the cybersecurity industries in terms of how we cooperate and connect and do things together in the future. So what is the SecOps Cloud Platform? Uh, the big question. So to begin, we will first uh, talk about what's the, what's the problematic that we're observing in cybersecurity. The core of it is really that we are seeing uh, a lot of solutions that are built as one size fits all. So they're built as one size fits all solutions that are trying to be the best at everything for everybody, everywhere, at all time in one cookie cutter way. So we're seeing an endless uh, series of products coming out in cybersecurity. There's a new category every week. Um, there's new types of attacks to worry about every week, and there's always a vendor behind it. And that's fine. It's good that we're building and protecting ourselves and, you know, always getting better, but there's a problem. And the problem is that there's the laws of physics. There's only so many products and so many vendors that we can onboard and that we can manage and integrate with and operationalize in, in our environment. So. Something doesn't work here. Something doesn't scale. So what's the modern way of doing cybersecurity, right? Uh, cybersecurity and IT is growing in complexity, scaling issues. What's the modern way? What's the new approach that we can take? And quite frankly, it's fairly simple in a way. Uh, what we think this new approach is, is really a new approach that somebody else has done in IT. And IT came up with the public clouds. So cloud providers, right? Everywhere people use them and they're amazing go-to-market accelerator, ways of building new things, of assembling the right solutions for their needs in IT. And really that's what we need in cybersecurity. We need a cloud platform specifically for cybersecurity. So what that means is Fundamentally, everything we're talking about needs to be multi-tenant, uh, API first, on demand, scale up, scale down, um, you know, all the values that you're associating with a cloud provider and how things are done, having the ability to have SDKs, having the ability to put together the right solution for your environment, for your use cases, accelerating a go-to-market for a product, not reinventing the wheels on things that are well understood. So those building blocks are now available 
through this SecOps cloud platform. So this environment is very much like a cloud provider. Uh, what are those building blocks, right? What are those types of solutions? So when we talk about the SecOps cloud platform, much like the public clouds in IT space, we're really talking about the types of solutions that are well understood, foundational solutions, right? Um, a virtual machine in, in IT is a pretty core solution. A relational database is a really core solution. And cybersecurity is getting to the point where we have those core solutions. Um, and so those core solutions would be things like retention of telemetry, being able to search telemetry, um, having access to the endpoints, whether that's through, you know, EDR, single agent to do detection and response directly in the endpoint, or it's as a way of deploying more things, more tools that are needed for cybersecurity in one seamless way. There's data observability that's also really well understood. So this idea of being able to take all of this data that is fundamentally, fundamentally available in the SecOps cloud platform, transform it, reshape it, optimize it, and get it to where it needs to be, uh, whether that's other products, uh, other you know, vendors, uh, point solutions, regardless of uh, what those are. So... The SecOps cloud platform, the net effect of this is a massive simplification in the SecOps or cybersecurity ecosystem of an enterprise or of an MSSP or really name it, pretty much all aspects of cybersecurity. It means that you can now have a single environment where all of those core understood solutions are available in a very, very easy way at whatever scale you need and in whatever way that you need them, right? We're talking about components that you're plugging together to make different things happen that you need to have on your side. So SCP really is here to enable the rest of the industry to do amazing things. And that's really how we see the position for the security cloud platform, the SecOps cloud platform. It's to be an enabler for the rest of the industry so that the rest of the industry, whether it's people in an MSSP performing security or in, uh, in an enterprise or people building products, to allow those people to focus on where they add the most value so that they can move fast, that they can build innovative things. So we think it's a huge promise. It's a huge concept and there's a ton of value. So now... Um, let's go and uh, talk to some people that are using the SecOps cloud platform um, that have been in uh, in the SecOps cloud platform discussions, uh, get their thoughts, how they see things. And at the very end of all of this, um, we will also be looping back with an announcement for a new feature of Lima Charlie. So we're really happy to be talking about a new feature that we're about to roll out. So very excited. Let's get going. Hello and welcome to the enterprise panel discussion around the approach of the SecOps cloud platform and how the approach brings tremendous value to enterprise organization. My name is Jessica Kreitzer. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Lima Charlie and I will be moderating the discussion today. With us today, we have Lima Charlie co-founder and CEO Maxime Lamothe Broussard, Turngate CEO and founder and Shmoo Group, Shmoo Group founder Bruce Potter and the former CISO of JumpCloud and Interpret Security Head of Product, Fred Wilmot, one of the co-founders of the Hershevet Group and principal consultant at Higgins Cybersecurity Consulting, Sean Higgins. Before we jump into it, I just want to thank you all for being here today and, and being able to share your valuable perspectives. Um, so we all just heard from Maxime and, and, and uh, his introduction of the SecOps cloud platform for the first time, which is incredibly exciting. Would love to kick off the discussion today with a question. Uh, how does the SecOps cloud platform address challenges faced by enterprise organizations in managing their cybersecurity solutions across diverse operating systems, networks, and applications? Well, um, I'll jump in. I, I think that, you know, from an enterprise perspective, uh, 
you know, anything you can do to simplify uh, your stack and how you integrate in with, with the uh, diversity of operating systems applications that you have, uh, the better off you're going to be. I mean, the reality is every minute that you spend managing that diversity is a minute that takes you kind of off target and away from the actual work of securing your enterprise and finding bad activity and investigating and things of that nature. Um, and so, you know, having the ability to, uh, um, you know, manage that in a, in a kind of consistent way, consistent layer, uh, you know, I think helps keeps teams uh, really on target and, and focused on the, the, the job at hand. Yeah, but I would agree with you, Bruce. I think the other part of it is, you know, the constant switching from tool to tool, and each tool has a different way of doing things. If you can bring it all into one central location, it makes it a lot easier for everybody to get their job done. Fred? Yeah, sorry, Sean. I I agree with that entirely, and I think part of the, the tool challenge is the switching back and forth, the... Historical philosophy is that there is a uh, single pane of glass that does the things, but um, obviously that isn't really a truism, and everyone tries to arrive there. The value of a of a of a of a sort of way of thinking about a security operations platform is bringing the workflow at least into that sort of philosophy, where you can think about the life cycle of that workflow in one place. I think that's particularly compelling, not just to alleviating the challenges people have with technology, but also what your super talented security guys are doing. So that's probably what I would say when we think about the challenges, you know, my, my biggest cost is people, not software. And so the level of execution there is fundamental. Well, just on that single pane of glass, everybody sells that, but you know, not many people achieve that. So getting to that point is where you want to be, not just a fancy glossy saying we are able to do that. I totally agree. And I think there's also a, a hidden part of that value, which is that, you know, it's one thing to have a product and kind of have it ready and it works for a known set of a couple of things here today. But to take into account that, you know, there's new platforms every day, there's new SaaS, there's new things that security needs to, to deal with um, every day. It means that the, um, you know, we need to bake in this concept that, you know, all of this, there's a genericity around all of this and that you kind of design from the, the get go with the assumption that this is just going to be expanding and transforming all the time. You're not just looking at at a set in stone, you know, single pane of glass kind of thing. Absolutely. I think the the sorts of roles that people need to perform across a security operations platform, you know, gets broader as well. So. You know, today what we talk about at Secured Operations yesterday was, you know, the entirety of a, you know, enterprise ecosystem, you know, and, and so I think the diversity of skill set and also the complexity of the problem continue to accelerate and how you operate on that type of data also, right, and timing becomes more and more impactful. Yeah, I think, Fred, that's a, a really interesting point that, um, you know, oftentimes I see organizations that have the security operations capability kind of locked into the SOC. And outside of that, no one has any idea how to interact with the tooling, how to handle that goes into this and that goes out as kind of thing. Um, and, and the reality is then they develop um, other ways of trying to find that data, other ways of doing kind of, you know, stunt security operations, which is super high friction, often results in kind of strange uh, outcomes. And so being able to uh, uh, facilitate pushing security operations knowledge outside of the SOC and make it a broader function, uh, you know, I think helps, uh, uh, you know, lead to better outcomes, really. Yeah, as well, you know, talking about people trying to do things outside of the SOC, you know, that could lead to holes in your security because they said, let me, I just need this, you know, as opposed to bringing it into one place where it's centrally controlled. You got all these holes all over the organization because different people have different controls or different tools. Absolutely. Great. Well, that leads me to my next question. Uh, you know, what specific benefits do you see the SecOps cloud platform offering to enterprise organization in terms of uh, scalability and agility? I think, you know, something that was mentioned earlier, this idea of being able to swap out technologies. Um, we 
oftentimes I, I think we, we can idealize that and say, oh, we do it for, you know, good reasons where there's a new tool with better benefits. But I think the reality is oftentimes uh, and it varies from organization to organization, but there's element technologies that we integrate that just aren't satisfactory. And we're going to go try the next one and hope maybe this one works out okay. Um, and, you know, it, I, I think every scissor that I talk to has at least some set of their tech stack that they churn almost yearly, right? Where they're like, well, this one didn't work. And then the contract expires. Well, that one didn't work. And you just keep playing that card until you find one that works. And, uh, you know, having the the ability for that not to be a big catastrophic um, operational impact and also not to be a gap because whenever you go from one technology to another you can have like a, a you know, potential material gap in coverage of that control and so being able to kind of seamlessly you know swing one control in and, and another one out uh, you know is is incredible to be able to to do that in a way that it, you know without being brain surgery like we had to do it before. Well, also turning up new features because every vendor keeps coming up with new features on their technology. You know, you, 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 it did one thing when you bought it. And now it does five things. And you didn't even know all the changes that happened along the way. So being able to seamlessly integrate those into your environment, into your operations will be a great benefit. Yeah, I see a lot of value in security engineering agility. And so things like uh, everybody has, you know, we, we do this, right? We have a struggle with this. When we think about integrating with a handful of different technology stacks, how do you make sense of, I need to write a, a specific detection for this platform, right? I need to write a, or I need to integrate this particular piece of intelligence, right? Into my way of doing detection engineering. Okay. Well, with my five platforms, right? I go do this, 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 this. Right. Instead of a consolidated approach on the on the process. And I really think the other part of it is the life cycle of that. And it's not just how quickly can I create a detection. Uh we're measured. We're measured on that. I mean, statistically people talk about that, right? But does that actually make you less at risk? Does it actually improve your exposure? Arguable. So the life cycle of being able to validate those assertions, I think, through a platform is incredibly powerful. I, I think it's really it's really fascinating from my perspective to uh, to hear you know people in the industry talk about scalability in such different ways uh, because you know as an engineer kind of historically first thing that comes to mind with scalability is is you know the the raw you know firepower of like the the iron and the servers kind of thing but it it absolutely is a core to cybersecurity to say you know scalability is really around scaling human operations as well as scaling like the, the raw technical operations. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really interesting to hear about how both of these things uh, really under the hood do come down to similar, to similar capabilities and this idea of being able to run, uh, you know, many different tools and to kind of scale the operations uh, across different pointed solutions without having to re-engineer everything, I think is, is the key to cybersecurity operations really performing this concept of like best in breed, right? Of truly being able to leverage those great solutions while not having to just rebuild everything every single year. Yeah. Last time I checked, people don't have the manpower to rebuild things every single year. So this is what the, <laughs> This is our decay rate, right? I think that's right. That's right. Yeah. So can you guys elaborate on how the open and interoperable nature of the SecOps cloud platform enables an enterprise to be able to create customized and customized combinations of, of cybersecurity solutions and kind of the benefits of that? Yeah, let me put on the CISO ad for a second. So vendor lock-in. No, thank you. I really appreciate the ability to operate and interoperate with those pieces. But also, you know, when, when I think about what, uh, for example, we're working on now, we being, you know, my company, the only folks that we really can tie into effectively that build value for the enterprise are people that operate in this capacity. So it's not just a ubiquitous problem for the buyer, right? It's a ubiquitous problem for the ecosystem. And so in order for the really think about what that level of, 
of consistency can be when you tie into it. It isn't, you can't think about it just as the one thing that I do, right? That, that tells the story, whether or not your ecosystem is going to be successful. We just talked about it's impossible for you to rebuild everything every year. So if you can't do that, it's not sustainable. If it's not sustainable, can't bring it in here. Just can't. Yeah, I think that there's a, um, uh, you know, the, the there, you get a little myopic sometimes looking at either the, the input and the detection that's going on around that or the output and the activities that are fed through the operations uh, uh, function in your organization. And there's a lot of power in being able to correlate and pull together disparate data sources, uh, you know, enrich data, recognize that like one, you know, audit entry is not necessarily bad, but in combination with 25 things that came from all these different places, it's bad. And on the other end, when it goes to kicking off automation and workflow, like it's not just one thing, it might be 10 things and some are serial and some are parallel and, and, and whatnot. Um, and there's a lot of power in that. And I, I think that as an industry, we've been uh, hamstrung by the tooling we've had historically, which forced us to operate in this kind of FIFO on the way in and on the way out. Um, and, and being able to you know, bring together all the inputs and the outputs together and harmonize and orchestrate in a, in a you know, more cohesive way is a more natural way of addressing the threats that we face. Um, and I think ultimately really helps organizations be, be more secure. I think the other side of it, though, is what are your options? Do you go with a vendor that provides a breadth of solutions for you in one package? And it may not be best of breed in each one of those areas. It may be best at one thing, but they've added all these other things to lock you into them. You know, whereas if you have a good SecOps platform, you can pick the best vendor that works for you for each of those different areas that you want to secure. Yeah, and I mean, I think in, in along that same line, sometimes you end up having two or three vendors that are covering the same area because they don't all cover it as well as you want. And so you end up with two or three solutions all working toward the same goal. And the more that you can cause them to work together in harmony, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's, that's particularly true nowadays where we're seeing pretty big, I, you know, what I would interpret as pretty big movements in the industry where we're really seeing that, you know, not everybody is able to do the same level of security across the board, right? Like smaller organizations, they might require something that is streamlined for them. Um, and to accomplish that, I, I think what we want to avoid is we want to avoid them losing out on uh, some of the sophistication that somebody who, you know, who knows what they're doing with cy in cybersecurity is able to implement and orchestrate. And I think the only way to go and, and bridge those two ends of the spectrum is by having uh, things like the cloud platform that, that uh, enable the, the people that know how to do cybersecurity and the solutions that they build and to offer them, it connects back to the previous topic, but at scale into other smaller organizations. Um, so, and, and that's really the definition of an MSSP in my mind. So I think it's, uh, it, it's really critical for us to find a way not to overly optimize the industry as a whole into like a specific type of business because as we keep going, there's going to be more and more disparity between, you know, the, the, the Googles and the, you know, the, the smaller companies that, uh, you know, that just try to get their business day in, day out to just keep going. Yeah, that's a super good point. And your mileage may vary, right, depending on what your level of maturity is and, you know, the operational capacity you have and the, I mean, the resources obviously behind it. And um Everybody also likes to talk about democratizing, insert the next word here, but, you know, philosophically, it sounds great, but um, how do you actually do that, right? And how do you enable people to collaborate around that is a bigger question. I haven't seen that really, uh, I haven't seen that really done yet, or done well, let's say. And I think, you know, the... To be blunt, uh, the, the larger you are, the more resources you get to throw at this problem. And so technologies like this kind of allow smaller companies to swing above their weight class. Um, you know, it, it helps them act 
larger than they are without having to make that that kind of large scale investment, which is which is huge because I think that the small and mid sized organizations struggle about making that kind of daily trade off of where am I putting my you know money, where am I putting my people resources, um, and and they get very fine points on like these are the riskiest things I think, and so we're going to go focus on these, and if there's a miss like boy, it can be catastrophic. Um, and the big companies, frankly, can just put frosting on the cake. They just like, we'll just cover everything because they can spend, you know, an insane amount of capital uh, to do it. And so, you know, the, the ability to uh, leverage and, and act larger than you are, I think is, is huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so in what ways does the SecOps cloud platform enhance visibility and situational awareness in an enterprise, allowing them to more effectively monitor and secure the organization? Well, part of it is getting closer to that single pane of glass, you know, bringing all the tools into one place, and not only just to see what's going on, but then to take actions from that single pane of glass to allow you to take actions to what may be happening in the environment across your tool set. I, I think, I think we're, I think that type of solution is, in one way is sort of raising the floor of capabilities that people can access and uh, in a way that they can build on top of, right? Uh, I think, you know, in my mind, anybody could go and, uh, you know, buy some some data lake license and and pay you know a ton of money to really go and throw everything that they own at all times into that um and and that's like there's value in that there's very real value in that the difficulty i think is in um when those types of solutions and like a data lake for example is you know becomes the product and like the the, the focus point of a, of a single company um then indirectly i think it means that uh, it's going to be, you know, partly priced accordingly. And like a lot of the value gets concentrated there and not on the hundreds of very powerful visibility, you know, features that should be on top of that, uh, that should just assume that layer. So, so in my mind, part of the idea of, of around the, the SecOps cloud platform is to say, Hey, you know, we need to, we need to move a lot of those features or, or those capabilities as assumptions that you know of course they're there and they're not that's not where the value is it's not in just accumulating this data but it's the starting point so let's make the starting point extremely easy to go and build on top yeah i think the um I don't know, infatuation of the data itself and making sure that, you know, it, we can store it and there's enough space and capacity and whatever. Like we've reached the point that all should be table stakes. Like this isn't a hard engineering problem anymore. Right. And and being able to focus more on, on the capability and outcome on top of that data is is uh, i think the next step but it's it's remarkable to me how many organizations still really just focus on the data itself uh and get totally mired down in that and i i, I have to check the calendar to see what year it is because i'm like isn't this solved can't we move past this isn't it cheap storage and cheap access why are we why are we still concerned yeah visibility for uh visibility's sake right here's my long list of things to consume and okay I've checked all the boxes. I've consumed it. I'm good. Um, and that is, I mean, all too common, but also, like you said, there's a pricing model around, there's an industry around it. And, uh, when you start thinking about what is that drive, what is it meant to provide for me? How does it actually equate to, you know, exposure or, you know, likelihood of something happening or the things that target me? I mean, yeah, no, no relevance to that. Right. And that's exactly the, you know, the instant challenge and the first gate to do anything else. And ironically, that's where most people stop, right? Great. And, and Fred, you can, I touched on this briefly, but, uh, you know, what do you guys think of the impact of the SecOps cloud platform on the overall efficiency and productivity of an enterprise security team? And how will it empower them to, you know, more proactively protect the organization? Yeah, I'll come back to that since uh, since I started it. Uh, I think the again the life cycle management of doing something. If I have a a hunt team that spent the time to investigate proactively, uh, 
and understand what's happening or look for a specific type of threat. Or I've looked at this latest uh, technique that's come out uh, related to a, a CISA report. You know, we would say, okay, cool. Um, tell me what's valuable about that. Let me go investigate what that looks like across my visibility. And then, okay, I want to do something about that. Let me craft something that gives me additional, you know, capability, whether it's a, a detection that should never fire, but if it does, you know, somebody should phone me at home or it's a, Hey, just, you know, some additional, uh, tattletales to help characterize behaviors I might be interested in. And then be able to associate that with the context of the business and then relate it back in, in a real, uh, sense by doing it right. And then getting real time feedback on it. I, mean, I think that's, that to me, uh, is when we talk about measured in, in times to detect, right. And we think about what those, uh, time to respond. And we think about all these other industry metrics that actually don't really tell a story about security, but tell a story about operations, right. Sort of reduces that to a pile of rubble and just says, look, okay, I found some interesting things proactively. I'm going to go look for this. I can make some changes in in this particular policy and, and implement this right now. So it means all that stuff just got shortcut down to the reality of doing the work in a very efficient and agile way, which is, I mean, if I were still, uh, you know, if I were still a real security guy, uh, that would make my day every day, right? I'd want to come to work <laughs> just to do that. Yeah, I think that the the tale of misery in so many socks is, you know, I find the same alerts every day, I investigate the same things every day. And, and, you know, we never make the changes to stop this thing from showing up. Right. And it's not stop it by like, turn off the switch. So there's no detection. It's stop it so that there's a better control upstream that the detection never has to fire. Um, and it's demoralizing to whole security teams. And, and oftentimes it's because as you work your way left in, in the process, it, it gets more and more difficult. There's, there's more, uh, you know, energy required, more effort, more resources to fix some of this stuff. And so at the end of the day, the SOC just continues to consume the same alerts and deal with the same incidents over and over. So the more that you can reduce that friction so that there's a clearer path to get to the left to fix the thing, not only are you more secure, but staff retention goes up, quality of life goes up, all these things that you care about, the people side of the team starts to improve. Um, and that has a real tangible impact uh, just as much as the quality of security controls do. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll layer onto that, that I, I think everything that, that you just mentioned is the reality for a specific team, right? For a specific team trying to achieve specific goals. And what we're also seeing is that there's more different, there's more than one team usually, right? There's more than just, uh, you know, the SOC trying to do threat hunting, but often there's uh, people that might be, you know, trying to look after compliance or, or looking around, doing some kind of reporting around security hygiene. And, uh, and part of this, uh, part of this, this scaling, I guess, right, uh, that it comes back to is the ability to do exactly what you mentioned, uh, having things, you know, tailored and, and efficient for, for multiple of those teams trying to get to different goals. And, and I think traditionally, you, you sort of would have had to approach this at a product level, right? Approach this, well, I have a product for my people that are trying to get this basic piece of information about, you know, uh, uh, security hygiene in my, in my company. And the value of looking at this as a generic sort of feature, right? A generic component of this, of this platform is a huge force multiply. And you're doing it in one place. You know, hopefully if you're bringing everything into one place, you know, the the thing you came up with, Fred, maybe it gets modified three times along the way because you look at different pieces of information so that, yes, the alert may look the same, but you've got different things attached to it. And then you can make different decisions to hopefully one day get rid of that alert. That's a super good point. So let me... and and. No names here as, as requested, right? But um, previously, um, when an organization takes that mantle uh, for you, whether it's a managed detection response or it's a, a vendor that offers a SaaS service, right? The orientation around that type of activity where it's not just your team, this is the other important part about it. It's not just your team doing that work, but a vendor providing you those things, right? Without the context of change and then changes happening, right, from a platform perspective, becomes something that denigrates. So if you don't, 
it's the negative side of the value uh, proposition of what a uh, psychops platform does is that it alleviates the concern that you no longer have sort of control and a you know autonomy around the things in your environment even if it is cloud hosted in that capacity and that is uh as a CISO that is so substantively valuable um i mean vendors get thrown out for that kind of thing and they and they do it is a real thing so the value is both a positive and a negative around the the value of what an enterprise has to maintain from a risk and uh you know a business risk perspective overall as a vendor as somebody doing the work so um i think that particular part sometimes gets overlooked just because you know we we, we do the vendor you know the third party risk reviews and stuff like this but we don't think about how that affects operational security and that capacity when somebody changes something well speaking of just speaking of mdr you know, if you've got an MDR provider, they're just looking at their solution. You know, so they may give you the same alert because all they see is this much data. Whereas if you bring it into your SecOps platform, now you can look across other feeds besides your MDR data. Great. Well, well, thank you all. This has been fantastic. I, I have one more question for Matt. Um, you know, what future developments can enterprises expect from the SecOps cloud platform and, and how will we continue to evolve to meet the dynamic needs of the industry? Yeah, uh, it's a good, it's a really good question because there's, there's a lot of places that we could go, right? In security, uh, I think the, the SecOps cloud platform kind of con by its concept means that there's a lot of places that it could go. And, and, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, what we're seeing is that we really want to, you know, bring the the accessibility, bring up the floor, right, of those uh, of security solutions uh, capabilities. And so, the the areas where we want to go is the areas of security that are well understood, um, that you know people have been doing for a few years, where the value is well understood. Um, and it's, you know, it's become, it's not that it's become like uh, redundant. I don't want to minimize it, but it's just become understood enough um, that there's an opportunity for, uh, for us to take care of all of these, uh, all of these features very easily for folks so that the teams can now start shifting their focus onto, uh, you know, higher level uh, solutions, right? Higher level, more pointed or more cutting edge. Or just uh, really focusing on the types of threats that that uh, you know that they need to focus on, so that we're not just constantly adding more and more things that a cybersecurity team needs to do, but we're also removing a lot of those things or just making them a lot easier. So that's really the the focus that we want to go forward is simplify simplify people's lives uh, on this without stifling innovation because there's there's so much innovation in cybersecurity. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you all. This has been a great discussion. We really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Welcome to the panel discussion around the SecOps cloud platform and how this approach brings value to those running MSSPs and other security service providers. My name is Christopher Luft. I'm one of the founders here at Lima Charlie, and I will be moderating the discussion. With us today is Paul Imey, co-founder and managing principal at Soteria, and Lee Salt, former co-founder and CTO at Harangi Cybersecurity, former chief incident response officer at Black Panda, and now principal investigator at Cyber Triage. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Uh, to get started, maybe you can tell me how the SecOps Cloud platform enhances the capabilities and offerings of MSSPs in delivering comprehensive and efficient security services to your clients. Yeah, I can I can start there. I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, what we love about Thema Charlie is it's really provided us a platform to kind of centralize all the things we're doing for uh, for our different clients. So yeah, you know, we started off using the EDR, like um, like many folks who worked with Lehman Charlie. But over the years, being able to to just add capabilities onto that and not have to um, you know manage a bunch of different uh, different tools and platforms um, everywhere. You know, we got a client who wants to bring in 
there are AWS uh, logs. We can bring those in here. We can we can bring in Office 365. We can bring in Microsoft Defender telemetry if we want to, and and you know play with that data all in one separate place, uh, or sorry, all in one single place instead of a bunch of separate places. But but I think in addition to that, like having that that central piece, it's also the ability to be able to then shoot out any pieces of, of that data to other platforms as we need, right? So if we want to to do some detection and response work and in the Lima Charlie platform, uh, but then do more kind of querying or, or uh, uh, you know, data exploration and Elastic, we can do that and we can really fine tune what we're sending where and, and how we um, control where that data flows, which just gives us a lot of creativity and, and the ability to customize things for either each client or build really uh, unique solutions to our business, but then benefit all of our clients uniformly. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree with that. Um, and definitely for me, it's the it's the built in integrations and the APF first approach. It's it's really it really enables SecOps culture, right? Where you have to kind of fight for that uh, with some other pl- uh, platforms out there, and you have to kind of modify your own your own workflows or your own skill sets to uh, to like work with some of these other platforms. Uh, but yeah, Lean Charlie, you can bring just about anything in. You can ship data out in, in very usable formats. Uh, I also like that billing is super transparent. Uh, so I, my use case is generally, or it's my use case has been, like I come in after the fact. So like there's already a breach. I've got to deploy something. I like using Cyber Triage. Or I like using Lean Charlie. And then through that, I deploy, have deployed Cyber Triage. And it really makes that super, it, it makes that workflow super simple. Uh, where I can get new IOCs, or I can identify, uh, you know, a latent piece of malware or or a malicious user, and then hit, uh, you know, upload those IOCs into Cyber Triage, and I can see the entire scope very, very quickly. Um, it's just a uh, very simple to use, very simple to integrate, and uh, much like Paul said, it, it doesn't matter to me what what pre existing technology exists or what the logs are, or really even what the formats are. I can just upload anything without without a ton of pain. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, could you provide some examples or use cases where the SecOps cloud platform has helped you respond to threats more effectively? Uh, sure, sure. I, I guess I can start with that one. Uh, at first, I think it's the ability to deploy whatever whatever package that we just kind of discussed. Like uh, Cyber Triage is obviously the first one, but there's other, other times too. Like I've actually deployed Metasploit and things like that to, um, like there's a whole, or I'm interpreter rather, there's a whole bunch of different um Different use cases there when you have an when you have a uh, an attacker actually active uh, active in the environment, and I think the ease of use to deploy whatever you need to is is a huge thing for me. Versus having to every single time figure out how to how to write a script. Uh, maybe you don't actually have error logs if the scripts don't fire correctly or whatever. You get a lot more of that out of out of Lima Charlie. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest thing for me when there's an, an actual adversary in the environment. We've already talked about the amount of telemetry that you have, but the interaction with the endpoints is uh, is very very useful. Yeah, I, I would zoom in on two things that that Lee um, hit on earlier. One, the the ease of onboarding. So we do some incident response work too, and you know we get somebody that comes in and says, "Hey, you know we've had an incident. Can you come help?" And we can go and spin up an environment like that, right? Uh, and that's a, a combination of a couple of different things that, that makes that possible. One is is just your model of, of being able to you know use a credit card to, to bring in a new environment. We don't have to go through a sales rep or deal registration process or anything like that. We can just um, spin it up and, and create a new organization and, and we're off and running. Uh, but then also the, that API first approach uh, that Lee mentioned is also super um, key with that. So we can spin up that environment um, and we have automation in place that we spin up an environment and then boom, it gets all of our, our environment configurations that our incident responders want. It deploys all of our threat hunting rules right out the gate. And then, then we can use the API to interact. Um, you know, if we're using the EDR, um, for example, we can use that API to interact with all of the um, agents at scale. So, you know, we've got an IOC. We know that this file is, is malicious and we need to scope out where that is. It's a, it's a quick, you know, a couple lines of Python to then go and look for that on every system. And if the system's offline, just tag it to go look for it later on. And then any system that's compromised, you just put the tag compromised on it or, or you know, yeah. IOC hit or whatever you want to. And it just, it just works and it's, it's scalable and it allows you to really automate things beyond um, what you can typically do in a, in a GUI. And again, very malleable, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things where I had, 
100% believe that the SecOps cloud platform is not designed for that use case, but it just gives you all these, uh, all these APIs and, and uh, extendability that you can just be creative with. And, and hey, you know what would be cool is if we could do this. Oh, well, we can do that. Like, let's just, uh, <laughs> we can do this and this and put them together. Good to go. Awesome. Um, how does the multi-tenancy feature of the SecOps cloud platform provide value to you, particularly in terms of resource optimization, cost effectiveness, and simplified management? Yeah, I, I think it really just allows us to, to manage different clients easier, right? So instead of having to, or even, you know, one client who's got separate environments, um, it's, it's very easy to say, Hey, you know, you want us to, um, you know, separate your, your European and, and us assets into different organizations because you want those alerts going into different places, or you want to have different, um, it or security teams that have visibility into it. It, it makes it very easy to, to divide up those assets. So we can manage multiple clients and multiple tenants like that, but also you can just create multiple tenants for the same client to kind of divide up um, those assets and, and um, allow them to customize how they want to see things. And that's that's been really, um, really handy. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, billing, again, super transparent with that, with that too. So it's very easy to pass that cost on to the customer without having to do crazy, crazy back-end math or like go back and forth with some sales rep somewhere. Uh, I've definitely had situations in the past where like larger customers, uh, the, the vendor would be like, oh, well, we're going to give this customer a, a, a lesser price. So that's what's guaranteed to the customer. But I'm still paying the original price because it's too complicated to figure that out. Uh, so I think the, the cost transparency there too, and you know, the uh, being able to manage different customers is, is quite important. Uh, outside of that also is um, the role-based access controls are just like, there's a lot less accidents, I think, uh, with the form, with the the format, the way that you guys manage uh, tenants, uh, I think that's I think that's quite important. And then, lastly, uh, you know, if you get into the point where you got a CFO or you got a sales team or whomever that really wants to do some sort of uh, cost basis analysis, like you know, who's the most who's the most expensive customer? Like, which which uh, features or whatever are, are we using, but not actually, uh, you know, spending money or uh, you know, what, what isn't getting monetized properly and so on. There's a lot more data to to actually do that and Lima Charlie than there is really in anything else. Like I, I really appreciate the granularity and the access to just about everything. Oh, that's great. Um, in what way does the SecOps cloud platform empower MSSPs to provide real-time visibility, threat detection, and incident response capabilities to their clients in a more effective and timely manner versus the traditional tools that are on the market today? Yeah, so I'll, I think I hit on that a little bit earlier, but I think first is like, being able to spin up a, a new organization, a new client environment, and you know deploy all of your rules across all of them uh, very effectively. But but I think beyond that, um, you know we're always putting forth new rules and new capabilities. And again, that API first approach, um, we don't have to do uh, click ops in order to go and, and make changes to all of our customer environments. We can make make that config change at one place and then push it out to all of our clients. Um, very seamlessly using uh, those APIs or, and using the, the Hive features and using the the automation and the configuration uh, uh, tools that uh, that are provided to us. And that helps us make sure that things are being done consistently, right? I think that's that's like the number one most important thing to do anything at scale is you have to do it consistently across everything. You can't have a different, different yep. setup or a different rule or a different process for uh, different... Uh, uh, clients or, or different endpoints or whatever. So being able to, um, you know, like, oh, I'd, I'd like to make this change, but I don't want to, you know, make it on any organizations and have to click through this thing 80 times. We don't have to do that, right? You can you can maybe try it at one organization, test it out, and then push it out to the world and um, and not have to deal with it. So I think that's that's really the key lever to uh, to efficiency. And then and then I'll say that the other um, big thing that that we've seen with drawn us to this as well as the speed of detection, right? So, you know, events come across the wire and into the platform and, uh, and that detection will, will hit our, um, hit our backend immediately, right? There's no uh, kind of lag time waiting for a query run or, or anything like that, or, or doing the scheduled queries to, to see if something hit every five minutes or, or something along those lines. It's just instantaneous. And, um, and that allows us to go and, and find things. A lot of times, some foreign native products uh, will will alert on them themselves. 
a uh, very similar experience with the with the speedy detection there. I think I think the the easiest way to demo that to say a customer or somebody else is when you actually like you can just uh, spin up a VM and register that VM on a like in your platform and it's seconds, right? It's like by the time you like alt tab back over to the other screen, it's already registered in the platform, which is crazy. Like nobody else does does it that fast. Uh, you know, uh, but something else we didn't touch on was like how easy it is to integrate other Yara signatures or um, or detection and response rule, rules from other folks. It's like you know, most of the time, or there's been lots of times where I've waited on a vendor to pro, you know to upload a signature, and they might not even have access to to the attack or that campaign, so they just don't have the data to write a, the write the signatures or whatever. In this case, it's the signatures are very simple. They're much easier to just like copy and paste. I've definitely gotten some across Slack and you know, uh, uh, Slack and Discord and so on, like in, in you know, a, in a pinch. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, like if you're trying to make this scalable, you just point it at a GitHub a GitHub repo and, and you're basically done. Uh, or you, you go through the add-ons and, you know, Paul's team does a great job with uh, with uh, the signatures that they're doing. And uh, I think that's that's a huge piece already is you don't have to go through, you're not, you're not beholden to a single vendor's rules. Uh, other rules aren't exorbitantly expensive, and when new stuff comes out, like just the cutting edge stuff, it's pretty easy to just copy and paste or or just point it in a new GitHub repo. Hmm. That, and I'll add on to that too is uh, I think another key differentiator for us is not having a an arbitrary limit on how many custom signatures and custom rules you can have. Yeah. I've seen that in other platforms. Like, yeah, yeah. you can do your own custom things, but only a hundred or uh, you know yeah. something like that. And, and we've got you know well over five hundred, maybe six hundred. Um, signatures in place at any given time right now and and that's fine and that helps oh, I, I love hearing that it's uh, working as intended yeah. um, can you discuss specific examples or use cases where your mssp have leveraged the secops cloud platform to enhance your service offering and provide value-added service solutions to your clients um i think yeah. from uh, uh, go ahead paul yeah I, i'd say certainly and and Again, it goes back to that creativity, right? So being yeah. able to um, to leverage different event types. So uh, the 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 fact that uh, different sensors and different um, uh, capabilities will emit different events, um, we can do things where we've had clients like, hey, you know, we would really like to know like if the server ever goes offline, and uh, you know, you can't write a you know this this device went offline for every system because then every time somebody closes their laptop, uh, you know, you're going to get an alert and it's going to flood you and be super annoying. But being able to do um, the granularity of rules that you can you can create, where I want to alert if this condition happens on a on an asset or on a sensor that has this tag, or you know with this host name specifically or, or anything like that, is a uh, is super powerful. And then another thing that that we've really enjoyed is the uh, the sleeper sensor um, capability that you can go out and deploy for a very low cost sensors and sleeper modes that you know don't cost the clients a lot of money. Uh, but if we have a an incident response retainer with them, it allows us to you know, come in and start an incident response and instantly have a presence on their systems, without having to um, you know go through the the process of of uh, you know deploying doing an enterprise wide software deployment in order to give us that access. And the I think the key there is that you know anybody who's done incident response um, for uh, for third parties has run into that situation where. You know, the incident happens and the first thing they do is just like yank the plug from the internet and, and take the entire organization offline. And so if you're trying to do incident response quickly, you know, it used to be that you would fly in with your Pelican cases and start doing <laughs> images, but, but we're way past that as an industry, thankfully now. Uh, uh -huh. But people still do that. And the the non-Pelican case, you know, doing remote forensics doesn't work if, if you're not connected to the internet. So having that ability there and, and making sure that people understand, like, if you just call us, we can take these systems offline using the sensors and then re-enable them more easily without, um, you know, without, uh, without you having to go pull the plug and then have to figure out how to reboot your entire network, <laughs> I think is a, is a massive step forward and it's saved a lot of headaches. Yeah, I'd have to second that. I think uh, the biggest challenge that I've, that I ever face in any incident response is that initial, the initial deployment, the initial scoping and initial deployment. Um, and you know, when you do it in a, in a peacetime environment, you know, it, it'll, it'll take a while. It might take a, a month or a few months to get, to get, um, those sensors pushed out and, uh, and so on. But when you're there, uh, and, and there's an active incident and tensions are high and people are worried about their jobs, you, you know, the, the victim or folks in the victim organization, a ton of them will just experience protectionism. 
Uh, so you'll get coverage on 80% of the systems, but you know, they'll try to hide some of them sometimes. And, and they're, these aren't like, these aren't like uh, surreptitious people or, you know, these aren't like bad people, right? They're just, they're just scared. They got, you know, mouths to feed at home and so on. Uh, so I think, you know, that, that sleeper, sleeper agent, um, thing is like really solves a huge problem for, for, uh, investigators that, that have the opportunity to take advantage of that. That's huge. Um, how does the interoperability and openness of the SecOps cloud platform enable MSSPs to integrate with other security tools and technologies, resulting in a more comprehensive and cohesive security ecosystem? I, I think we've touched on this a, a good bit already, uh, but but really it boils down to so one, I just it, it just doesn't matter to me which technology that you have, right? So that that solves a lot of problems. Uh, that solves a lot of problems already. So it's not a fact of having to wait for for licenses or for a customer to have licenses expire and then get a new technology that integrates with with my stack as a service provider or whatever. It just like whatever you have, it just works, right? So. Uh, you come in and, and you have that that thing that all CISOs and all incident responders want. You have visibility, uh, and you, you make make with it what you want. Uh, you know, I've, I've had some customers that ever like, wait, we don't want this much visibility. We've we've never had this before, and this is not <laughs> this is not a clean as of an environment as, as we'd like to have. So you kind of have to help them through that every once in a while. But um, I, I think I think that's it. It comes back again to the interoperability and the the built in add ons. Yeah. I agree. It's it allows. I think it comes back to just allowing your team to be creative. Like we have this thing that we can plug data into and then make things happen, and then and spit uh-huh. the same or modified data out to somewhere else, and that just opens you up to to tons and tons of possibilities. And um, and sometimes it just comes from the most random places, like uh-huh. you know non security use cases and and things like that. Of like, well, what if we could just like take this data in and then like fire an alert? And I think. Chris, you did a YouTube video one time where uh, you made Lena Charlie alerts, like, you know, change the color of your, like, lights in your house or something like that. And, uh, yeah, you can do weird things like that. And, you know, there's silly, uh, you know, debatably useful things like that, that you can do. But then it starts getting you thinking about, you know, how else you can, um, you can, you know, leverage those capabilities and, and just, like, string the ideas come out sometimes. Yeah, that was a fun project I uh change the color of my hue lights when somebody opened a certain file on my laptop. So uh, just proof of concept. That's that's what it was. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So in terms of compliance and regulatory requirements, how does the SecOps cloud platform assist MSSPs in meeting the stringent security standards and ensuring the protection of sensitive client data? Yeah, I think the the biggest one that that gets helped there is uh, data retention, right? Being able to just say like, hey, we're going to, we're going to capture this telemetry or we're going to capture these logs and by the way everything is stored by default for 365 days that answers a, a lot of questions and, and shuts down some of the debates sometimes because that that checks off that um that data retention uh, yeah. box that people need and and just allows them to know that they can have that uh same thing with uh, uh you know other other data sources like just being able to pull all that information in even if it's not an active detection or response case you know you got it and if you need it later on, you can then grab it out of that data store, shove it into some other uh, platform for analysis or, you know, for somebody else to take a look at or, or to provide that data elsewhere. And it just, uh, you know, it just works and it, it makes it easy to, uh, to get it done. So you don't have to think about it. Yeah. I, I think there's a, a few checkboxes uh, there, depending on the, which compliance, uh, compliance screen, uh, compliance scheme you're beholden to or regulation or, or whatever it may be. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind, though, is more of an idea, so not, nothing that I've actually deployed before, but just compliance monitoring and reporting in general, right? So, you know, some of that can be gathered straight through uh, straight through Lima Charlie's telemetry. Uh, so, you know, some of that can be aggregated through other data sources in the environment. And, and you can also use a, uh, you know, the, the, the deployable payload feature to deploy some compliance checking thing and, and, and draw that data back to create a, a much more automated report. So I think... Um, there's a lot of a lot of possibilities around this one. Um, how does the SecOps cloud platform enable MSSPs to differentiate themselves in a competitive market by delivering tailored and customized secu- customized security solutions that meet the specific needs of your clients? And for me, uh, so you know, I'm not the traditional MSSP, or in a, and I haven't been where you have you know eyes on glass, twenty four hours a day sort of thing. Uh, but having worked with 
uh, MSSPs my entire career, I, I think the biggest thing for me is communication and being able to answer hard questions, right? It's like, what data do you have? And most of the time, the answer to that is, I don't know. And I have to wait some number of days. I'm like, okay, well, what data do you do not have? And the answer is also, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, just being able to have, uh, you know, again, it comes back to the the interoperability, right? It's, just, it's, it's all there. There's not 15 tabs you have to go through to figure out whether this is there or that's not there. You know, if you want to look at how long you have data, that's pretty easy to easy to get access to. Uh, and so on. So, so for me, the, the biggest dif- differentiator is just like quality of service. It's just there and it's simple to use. And you can answer the hard questions because all incident responders and all MSSPs get hard questions either from the customer, the compliance auditor, or the regulator or outside counsel. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we're, we're more of an MDR than an MSSP, but it, it gives us those MDR capabilities where we can, we can find the bad things, but then using the platform we can automate a lot of uh, response actions or um or use it just for alerting so our our incident response team can take uh, response actions but the the extensibility of that i think is is really helpful and then also uh, the again the the granularity of things that you can do with the dnr type of rules to say you know hey we've got you know we've got our standard library of, of detection and response rules that um, that we apply to all of our customers out the box but if there's a a custom use case or, or a specific issue that a client needs to have visibility on, then um, then we can do that. We can, again, get very creative and thoughtful with that and not say like, well, you know, we, we can't really do that because we're running up against our, our limit on custom detectors or you know, the, the platform doesn't support that. You know, we can we can do pretty much anything with the data that's coming in and, and use it in ways that aren't always uh, obvious or intuitive. And that, that allows us to to be more partner-like with our customers, right? So we don't have to just say that, hey, we're using, you know, we're going to give you uh, the Lima Charlie, you know, platform. We're going to take in your your logs from this, that, and the other. And we're going to spit out the sections, and then you know whatever else you need to do is on you, right? We can we can have uh, we can have customers come to us with the hard problems and, and be able to partner with them to, to solve them instead of saying like, sorry, it's not in the SOW, right? Um, it, it gets our folks excited because like, oh, we've got this tool and we can figure out how to, to make it do this cool trick. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Some great answers. It's great for me to hear all this too. Uh, it makes me feel great about the work we're doing. Yeah, um, I, I, I think there's another piece of that too. That, oh, it's, it's, again, it's another idea that I've had that, that's like, you know, this is a possibility that's unlocked here. It's, it's like, a, it's like great automation capabilities with the API, API first approach. And I wonder how, like how much of that SOAR workflow uh, can actually get integrated. Right. So like you have an alert where a new user is created in your organization. Does that user have MFA enabled yet? Right. It's like, is that something that can be built into Lima Charlie? And I, and I, I suspect it probably can, um, with the, with the right, you know, Python scripts on the back end, uh, using the, using the, uh, uh, the API the right way, you know, in those situations for those customers that just can't afford SOAR uh, or, or just don't want it because the organization's not quite big enough yet, there are some some interesting workflows that can be enabled uh, that can be enabled here with with not a ton of effort. Mm-hmm. Good. All right, so we're bumping up against time, so this is the last one I got for you. Sure. Um, what opportunities do you see for MSSPs and other security service providers to leverage the evolving capabilities of the SecOps cloud platform to expand their service offerings and address emerging cybersecurity challenges in a rapidly evolving threat landscape? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's just you know one of the one of the the emerging problems that everybody's having is uh, security is moving off of the traditional like on-prem network and into um, you know, the cloud uh, in different environments, right? Uh, whether it's, it's you know, traditional cloud platforms uh, like our AWSs and GCPs, um, but also the, uh, like, just random SaaS applications. And thankfully, I think SaaS applications are starting to get better, um, some better than others, at making uh, all the log data available uh, to to the consumers and to the companies that are using them. So I think that's that's where a lot of the value is going to start coming from is, is you know, finding... And where are your your critical apps that are outside of those traditional workloads that like you know these are covered right this this problem's been solved how do you how do you get telemetry or, or logs off of your you know, your windows devices that's a solved problem but you know as, as we get more and more into these uh, other platforms the ability for uh for the, for the cloud platform the SecOps cloud platform to be able to just take in telemetry from anywhere 
and do things with it and then report things and then send it elsewhere. I think it it just unlocks more possibilities and, and will allow folks to uh, kind of adapt as uh, as new things come along. So having that building block approach where like, yeah, we've got these core capabilities and this stuff works and it's going to get the job done. Um, but also we've got more of this abstraction layer that allows you to uh, kind of tinker with it and, and make things you know, be what you want them to be. Uh, that's going to, uh, I think people just need to be creative and try to think outside the box of how can I use these in a way that's not, um, not been predefined and, and is not, you know, necessarily what's on the, on the label um, of what it's intended to do, but yeah. what, what can it do? Right. And, and tap into that hacker mindset. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, putting that service services, uh, leader hat on, I think, or like, you know, after the fact services leader, less of the MSSP role. You know, for me, it comes down to response services, compliance, auditing, or checking, which could probably be done on a quarterly or or regular basis rather simply, even if you're just using the sleeper agent, right? I think there's a ton of use use cases there for municipalities and college systems and community college systems. And I think lastly is, is exactly, you know, like there's very little there's very little for cloud security or cloud visibility from a security perspective and and what's there just charges you a fortune so i think it it also comes back down to the the transparency and costing and, and the cost predictability it's like this is this is the platform to innovate with awesome well thank you so much for joining me today gentlemen this was a great conversation and uh, music to my ears to hear our customers speak so highly of what we're doing so thank you Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Congrats on congrats on getting it here. Can't wait to see what comes next. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the panel discussion around the SecOps cloud platform and how this approach brings value to those building security products and services. My name is Ros Haliluk, and I am a head of product here at Lima Charlie, <laughs> and I will be moderating this discussion. With us today, Eric Capuano, CTO and founder of Recon InfoSec, and Amanda Berlin, lead incident detection engineer at Blumira. Thank you so much for joining us as we discuss the value of the SecOps cloud platform for those building security products and services. Let's start by talking about problems. Uh, you're both accomplished technologists. What are some of the challenges that builders of security products and services face <laughs> when they are looking for technologies to design their offerings on top of? Okay. I can share a little bit about, you know, some of the problems that we faced, you know, um, recon is kind of unique in that um, for, for the first several years of our, you know, sort of building uh, process, we relied heavily on, on DIY approach, you know, uh, build, maintaining our own infrastructure, leveraging open source uh, tools and platforms, which, which was, was full of wins for us, by the way. Uh, but it comes with a hidden cost. It's a hidden cost of a lot of complexity, a lot of uh, troubleshooting, you know, a lot of, um, you know, building the integrations yourself and, and also then troubleshooting these things when they inevitably uh, fail. Um, so, it's 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 a very complex, but you know, obviously financially rewarding approach to take. But it, it does require just a lot more kind of hair pulling and and, and you know head banging to, to kind of keep that solution um, humming along. And that that doesn't even that doesn't even start to 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 weigh in on all the other complexities of of running, for instance, a security operations business, right? So you you've got more important fires to to to, to worry about, like actual customer you know security incidents and things of that nature. So. Um, a, a huge kind of evolution in that journey for us was was identifying a, a a service level sort of platform that we could offload all of that complex infrastructure log ingestion uh, threat detection engines and all that stuff uh, somewhere else that that you know we don't have to worry about the underpinning kind of technology as much anymore we can focus a lot more on bringing the fight to the back yeah to- totally agree <laughs> um uh, just just around, you know, there are there are always going to be multiple options to you know solve the same kind of problem, right? But when you find yourself, oh, I, I, we're going to start. We we are starting to uh, our business, and we know we want to do the thing that we want to do. And to do that, we have to we're going to use these open source products, right? So you you start with the free, the open source, whatever, um, and then you get a little ways down the road and find out those limitations. And those limitations come in with that complexity, right? Because you want things um, 
a certain way for your customers, right? Whether you're trying to make things quicker or easier or whatever for for your end user, your customer, that puts a whole lot of complexity back on you, right? And then you end up building more integrations, more um, uh, fixes, more things around this this free service just to manage it. So at that point, now you are doing your main job of, of providing this product, but now you have all of these other side side things that you're also trying to manage and and troubleshoot and deploy and make sure there's guidance around. And it's just like, uh, you know, stacking, stacking, stacking more, more technologies and stuff on top. So yeah, off, offloading some of those things to a, to an open service um, that kind yeah. of, it's like, oh my gosh, just going to fix all the problems that we had in this area. There, and, you know, an, another, another major pain point that you feel whenever you're trying to cobble together your own sort of approach to this is um, where, you, where you start to feel the most pain is when you start to scale it. Right. Like you, you might, you might build and deploy something that, that works, right. A, a general kind of monolithic sort of infrastructure approach using open services or, or, or um, applications. Um, and then you start to encounter these problems where, okay, we've got this potential customer, they're massive. And now we're worried about signing them on, like, which you, you wouldn't think in a million years that as a, as someone running a business, you'd be worried about taking on new, big, awesome customers. But when you're on this sort of monolithic, uh, this infrastructure, that now becomes a concern. If we take these, if we take this customer off, is it going to break us? Is it going to break our infrastructure? And so moving to an a, an open, infinitely scalable sort of cloud solution, right? That that really has, I mean, you know, let's be honest, you know, it has no limits, but that's, everything has limits. But but the cloud, that, you know, using kind of the, the on-demand, infinitely scalable sort of capabilities that Lima Charlie brings. It's the last thing I think about now. I don't worry about the size of a customer I bring on. Like, bring it. You know, it could be 15 times. You know, the the largest customer we have. No, no concerns at all. Um, it doesn't it doesn't change the math for us, right? And and knowing that we've got a fixed cost for that as well is huge. Because another issue that we used to encounter um, on our kind of traditional infrastructure was it was not as as it was more of a dynamic cost on a customer basis, right? Some customers cost more than others, and it was it was a really complicated. To try to figure out, you know, what our margins are, and 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 are we are we delivering this service in an affordable way, or I'm sorry, in a profitable way, so that we can continue paying our analysts and keeping our servers running, right? And so now with that fixed cost, all of that that scale of concern and profitability, it's 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 a thing of the past. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about just scaling the technology, right? You have to worry about scaling the support, the documentation, That's right? the edge cases, the cost, yeah, everything. Yeah. It's not just a, a one-time, oh, we can scale this one. Is it, <laughs> exactly right. Is it fair to say going. that by abstracting the hard part of managing the infrastructure, you are able to focus on your own uh, core value proposition yeah. more? Would that, yeah, would that be the right way? <laughs> it's, Russ, it's, it's more than fair to say it. That ought to be your mission statement uh, because – because that's exactly what happened for us, right? Um, we we went from spending probably thirty to forty to fifty hours a week just maintaining underlying infrastructure. It was a it was a massive undertaking, um, and now all of that time's freed up. And, and what's really cool is the resources that we were using to maintain all that monolithic infrastructure. We've just simply shifted into building and creating new and awesome and exciting things customer facing things like front end applications and and more uh, 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 feature request ingestion from our customers on new and interesting things they'd like to do we didn't have time for those things before so we we stagnated on the new innovations because we were just constantly just focusing on keeping the the, the monolithic sort of enterprise infrastructure alive and, and happy so it, 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 it's it's an understatement to say that it has freed us up to focus on the things that we're more passionate about that are differentiators for us that make our customers happy. Nice. Yeah, and uh, somewhat related. Um, what what I found interesting was you know we were doing things a certain way and, and trying to scale and you know that was that was kind of a uh, a pain point once you once you start like uh, onboarding a lot of customers. Um, 
when we did start using Lima Charlie, we had to think of how to ingest data a different way, which is going to end up uh, changing the way how we do it overall, right? So it's not, it wasn't just a, uh, a shoehorn, let's, let's replace one thing for another. It's a, oh my gosh, this actually makes the, the process that we're doing internally for our customers ultimately better. And, and Ross, I want to add one thing to that because it, it's 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 one thing to say that it freed us up to do other more exciting things, but I, I should also give additional credit to say that one of the most exciting things about our adoption of Lima Charlie was the new capabilities. Right, there were things that we couldn't do, even if we had the time to do them. We didn't have the the technology to to do it. Right, you know things like on demand hunt, on demand yard ER scanning based on detections, and like. You know, the list goes on. There were so many things that the sensor uh, uh, brought to the table for us that, that were just not even, they were daydreams, you know, before. And so it's it's kind of a twofold issue. We have more time to do more of the exciting things, and we have more exciting things to kind of tackle. Uh, and that's that's super cool. Awesome. Uh, I'm curious, since since you, you've kind of started touching on some of the ways in which you use the, the SecOps Cloud Platform uh, for your use cases, like what are some of the, like, would you be able to discuss a specific success story uh, in terms of like how, how you've done it or maybe what capabilities you've implemented and, and how did that go for you? I, I can go, sure. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm not sure how many people listening uh, know about this, but there have been uh, recently a lot of exchange vulnerabilities um, and other like web server related really vulnerabilities that have been taking a huge hit on uh, not only small and medium businesses, but lots and lots of different organizations. Um, there's a Moot vulnerability that was uh, that came out not too long ago. All of the exchange stuff, there were some other like... Um, Power application vulnerabilities that were all web based. Um, the one thing that I I enjoy that we've deployed so far is the ability to, based on our detections of Lumira, to automatically isolate something and prevent further um, uh, compromise. Right. So one of those things is um, uh, a file being written to a device that you know ended up compromising an entire uh, application server that was on the internet uh, and the ability to automatically isolate that and it just kind of cuts off an attacker, uh, at least from that host, right? <laughs> yeah, so so my example would actually be similar in a lot of ways to Amanda's. Um, so it, it's kind of twofold. The, 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 the two really exciting capabilities that we've had that have been very useful to us is one, the retrospective capability of being able to run a hunt against a year's worth of telemetry a customer environment, right? Like, so when, when the IOCs come out, we can, we can go back and see, you know, 12 months, right, of history of, of any of those IOCs being present in the environment. But here's where it was a major game changer for us in a recent uh, ransomware uh, case. We were working in IR for a company we had just begun our relationship with. And uh, we, we've come in and, you know, generally in a, in a, in a ransomware situation, especially for uh, an IR person, you're coming in after the damage is done. You know, the, the things have been blown up and it's all over. And I, you're just kind of doing a post-mortem and trying to understand root cause, right? To give them some mitigating, you know, steps that they can take to prevent it from happening again. Um, we got involved in this uh, ransomware event just in time where th there was a system that was impacted. Um, and so what we did was we rapidly deployed the, the EDR agent. And we, we extracted all the IOCs, everything that we could learn about the system that was impacted to understand, you know, the, the malware they were using, the C2 they were using, the, 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 uh, the persistence mechanism and all that. And with the speed of Limit Charlie, we can just immediately craft those into DNR rules that would, if it, if, it, if it observes any of this activity on any other system in this environment, just instantly quarantine that machine, right, to stop the bleeding. And that was incredibly useful for us because we did uncover a couple other systems where the attacker had already begun the, the process. They were they were starting to take the steps that they were taking leading up to the ransomware. And boom, those rules kicked in, isolated those systems, the attacker loses access to them. And so we were able to prevent further damage uh, being done, right? Now that's, you know, you're not always that lucky, but it's it's having technology that enables us that if we do parachute in at the opportune moment, do I have the tools that would allow me to move at the speed of the attacker, right? Because your traditional kind of IR toolkit 
it's you're doing autopsies, right? You're coming in after the damage is done. And even if you do find yourself in the middle of it, your tools might not have the capabilities of the real time telemetry streaming, the DNR, you know, detection response and, and actual take action capabilities um, uh, that, that, that we have now. And so that's, that was a major win for us very recently, actually. Super cool. And I would assume for somebody building products and building services on top of the, uh, of the SecOps cloud platform, having the ability to do things in real time must be critical. Absolutely. The fact that you guys built this API first platform, um, right, enables us to, there's no limit to what we can do. Um, and we can do everything in real time, right? So we interrogate systems in real time to populate inventory databases, right? Um, so that at any moment, we know all software packages, all services, everything on the system. Um, and we, that's a simple API call away to populate that data into our application that our analysts use, but also our customers use. Right, which is a really interesting thing, by the way. You know, because of all the capabilities of the platform, there's no limit other than your imagination on what to do with that data. Right, so it's not just the security tool anymore. Right, because there are so many things that an IT team could benefit from that those APIs expose. So we built that functionality into our customer-facing application because most of my customers are IT teams. Right, they don't they don't care about all the cool SOAR and, and EDR and stuff that we're using on the back end. They want simpler things that help make their job easier. And so we provide that data to them in the application because of all the API, the APIs that are exposed that we can, we can grab that data. Um, so absolutely. It, it's, it's kind of a dream come true for a product builder in any facet of sort of it or security. Yeah. Cause I mean, what else do you have the option of, right? You have, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy and deploy an asset management software. I'm going to buy and deploy an EDR. I'm going to buy and deploy um, uh, something to ship logs. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. Now you have five endpoint <laughs> agents on a device. Y yes. That if there was an open API, you probably could have done it all in one thing. Um, and, and Amanda, Amanda just hit the, the, the silver bullet. The, the golden issue of our, of our industry is agent is a four dollar work. Right. Customers do not like having multiple <laughs> agents on their systems, even even their own agents. But then as a service provider, I'm coming in to drop yet another agent. Right. And so any opportunity you can find to consolidate that functionality, get it all into one if you can. Right now, not to say we're going to get rid of every agent that exists, but we we've, we've come very close. Right. We we need very little that that outside of what, what Lima Trolley can provide, Sec SecOps Cloud Platform can provide. It, it, it's covering things like RMM and, and CMDB and asset management on top of its obviously core functionality of being a really solid EDR agent. And, and, and the ability for you, for, for any customer to be able to build something on top and, and configure it the way it makes sense for them. Like my understanding is that when it comes to the enterprise environment, for example, yes, you can, like you can still make things work by deploying a bunch of different tools and then stitching them together with a SOAR platform or something similar. But when you're building a product or you're building your own offering, you can't build it on top of a, a traditional EDR or on top of a traditional asset management solution, right? That's right. You, the last thing you want to do as a product builder is build a product on top of other products, right? Because now you're, you're at someone else's mercy, you know, the license model, the, 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 the billing, the price, the, the, the cost of that other product, right? I would much, much rather as a builder build on top of an abstract sort of agnostic uh, service layer, right? That, that, you know, the, the only business that that, Companies in think AWS, for instance, they're just there to provide infrastructure, right? I'm not, I'm not paying them license fees to use additional capabilities that they could take away at any given point in time, and I'm, I, and I'm not, you know, my success is not tied necessarily to their success because at the end of the day, AWS is just a neutral sort of service provider. Um, they'll always be providing EC2 instances, right? And so, yeah, as a as a product builder, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to have those external dependencies if you can avoid it. What uh, I'm curious for for a security vendor, what are some of the ways in which uh, the SecOps cloud platform shortens the time to market, and like what's what's the significance of using it to get the, the new ideas to the market quickly? Amanda, if you want um, to take a stab, I, I, it's kind of a repeat of my last answer, almost right. Um, but it's, you have less management interfaces to work with, less um, wow. 
uh, salespeople to deal with, less uh, software to deploy, uh, there's less learning curves, there's just less of everything when you don't have to rely on five different pieces of technology to do the same thing. Uh, for, uh, I'm curious, Amanda, for, <laughs> from, from Blumira's standpoint, and again, as much as you can share publicly on the call, uh, how long did it take from the beginning of, like, from, from the moment uh, Lima Charlie uh, and, and the SecOps uh, cloud platform we offer was chosen as a way that f for, for Blumira to leverage it for what you were building to the moment when you had something live in production? Sure. And I actually remember the first call I was on that they mentioned Lima mm -hmm. Charlie. I was waiting to get at an airport mm -hmm. and I stopped at like a gas station to take a conference call. Um, and that was in mid December, I believe. Maybe in mid November. And uh, that was just us talking about it, right? No contracts had been signed and no I mean we looked at some documentation, right? There was a there was a whole lot. Um and we were able to uh, with only a handful of people build mm -hmm. a full immigration with our product mm -hmm. in three months, three and a half months, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it was, I mean, we're not mm -hmm. offering everything right yet because that's a very small amount of time to offer everything that you guys have, mm -hmm. you know, capability for. Um, but just the fact that we were able to do the things that we wanted to do so quickly. Um, one is like a testament to like how you built that API. Also, uh, documentation. Great job. <laughs> Your guys' documentation, top nod. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, to wrap up the discussion, one last question. Uh, what is the one secret or a piece of advice you would like to share with practitioners and, and people in the industry thinking about building their own startups, uh, whether it's a product or a service? And the advice that I would give is, is, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of room. There's, there's plenty of opportunity out here in this space. I mean, it, it's, it, there's so many organizations that need this level of service that traditionally or historically have not been able to afford it, didn't know it was out there. Um, and with, with the, 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 you know, deployment of something like the security op, security ops pub, uh, public cloud, like it, it's never been more accessible. I mean, because I'll say years ago, it was not an easy thing to get an MSSP or India yeah. off the ground. A lot of elbow grease, a lot of hard work. You had to really, you know, master many different tool sets to be able to just simply be ready to deliver the service. Uh, now that 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 bar couldn't be lower because you can turn on Lima Charlie, you can turn turn this on, start deploying agents right away. Already have a production rule set, you know, uh, running in the background, and now you're just fine tuning it. Right. And you're not you're not having to worry about infrastructure. You're not having to worry about operations. You're not having to maintain and troubleshoot, you know, endpoint agents. You're just focusing on the customer's experience and, and finding and trends, you're paying right? and you're and paying so, for what you use. So you don't need to meet the minimum the minimum right. spend. You don't have to negotiate a five year long contract and predict, like forecast your own capacity. You say, Hey, maybe maybe in in, in July by the time we launch we will have uh, 25 endpoints, and that's still okay. You can start your business and scale from that's there. Right. Yeah. That's right, because like one of the issues that I faced when I was getting recon off the ground was making that decision of, what, you know, are we going to be an alien vault shop? Are we going to be a Splunk shop? Are we going to be, you know, an open search or elastic search at the time? You know, and, and weighing all the different pros and cons and the costs and the the the, the advantages. And um, that's you know, we went with the open source because, for instance, you, you take a look at, you know, I will I won't name vendors. But one of the, the big name kind of scene vendors that targets MSSPs, you know, the, the, the pay to play just to begin with them is a very high, very high number to hit. And you're like, but I'm just getting started. How do I, how do I justify that expense just to get my very first small customer on board? I, you know, I'd be losing money every month until I brought on three, four, five more customers. So the, it's a game changer to be able to pay, you know, pay as you go. So if you start, you get a customer, like you said, with 15 endpoints. You can deliver that service, you know, uh, obviously you're going to want to grow, but, but you can deliver that service. You won't be losing money doing it. Um, and it grows with you. And that, that's the greatest thing I think that's happened to, you know, entrepreneurs looking to start this sort of a, a business. Yeah. And I say, just don't be, don't be afraid of all of the change. It's definitely going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, when you're in a startup, uh, constant change, you know, when you, you have to expect 
that if you are using open source products, that at some point you're probably going to have to find an actual solution for that. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I think you don't necessarily have to do a long-term plan or anything around every specific use case. Um, but, you know, rolling with the punches and kind yeah. of just accepting the fact that every day is going to be a new day uh, until you, you know, get bought out basically or, or become or you become until you make whatever. it and become big not yes right exactly <laughs> it's just uh, a wild west of um whole bunch of people trying to do great things awesome. yeah well thank you so much amanda thank you so much eric it's been a great conversation and definitely looking forward to seeing what we can do together in, in the future and how the SecOps cloud platform can be leveraged by other builders and other practitioners looking to start their own businesses or scale their own businesses, in fact. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion around the SecOps cloud platform and how this approach brings value to the whole ecosystem of companies that follow very similar philosophies to those of us here at Lima Charlie. My name is Matt Bromley, and I'm the lead solutions engineer over here at Lima Charlie, and I'll be moderating this particular discussion. Thanks for being here. With us today, I've got John Tuckner, the head of Tynes Labs over at Tynes, Casey Smith, senior researcher at Thinks Canary, and Huxley Barbie, the organizer of B-Sides NYC, and security evangelist at Run Zero. Guys, thanks for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, All right, first and that. foremost, how does the SecOps cloud platform create a favorable environment for cybersecurity vendors to integrate their solutions? Anyone wanna take this one first? Yeah, I mean, I'll kick off since Tynes is like an API first uh, driven platform. Uh, we're just like so focused on connecting with anything that features an API, but like not only that, I'm just so excited that like recent security software is becoming a lot more API first and uh, instead of tacking it on as an afterthought, which is like how I kind of came into the industry. Um, this is even kind of like super nerdy, but uh, I get a ton of joy out of like clicking on something in the web UI of a tool and seeing the request actually get made in dev tools and then like copying that out and doing stuff with that. So um and then I also think like, it's just really interesting to see vendors start to come around uh, and realizing that internet connectivity, even with like competitive tools and things like that, is just what the market wants after like uh, all these new M and A's uh, and the sprawl of tools that just get out there. There's, there's very little room for like secret sauce anymore, especially with uh, like a across interconnectivity and integration of solutions. So the more that we can like focus on just embracing that, uh, I think we'll just be more successful. I'll, I'll add that the, the background here is that the security industry has very little consolidation, right? It's highly segmented, highly fragmented. Uh, I've in the past have had customers that had over 70 vendors that they had to deal with. And the fact of the matter is there are no security solutions out there that are good at everything. They tend to be good at one or two, a few couple of things. And every security team wants to leverage the best of breed for that particular use case. And they, they, if without integrations, they have to resort to swivel chairing, if that's a verb <laughs> that I can use, well, uh, where they're you know copying, pasting, and putting stuff into spreadsheets, and it just doesn't scale very well. And so you need to have uh, integrations amongst all these different tools to really get you know true value out of all these investments. Yeah, for sure. I think you know again, like you like you mentioned, there nobody has a single product they're defending with, and the idea of APIs and access lets teams be accurate, faster, scale, and respond in tempo with attackers because uh, at, at any given moment, uh, they could be hitting a tool and you need to get the data out at your data as a, as a security team. So to do defense and response at scale, you need that integration, you need the speed and accuracy. And, and I think it's awesome to see. You guys have hit upon some of my favorite keywords, which are speed, accuracy, but more importantly, keeping up with the speed of adversaries as well and i think that's one of my favorite things about uh being able to look at bringing different vendors together being able to bring those best of breed solutions together and saying i'm not doing this be only because i want the best for everything i'm doing this because i'm in a race and i am racing against someone whose real purpose is to take time away from me in the form of you know, a compromise in the form of an intrusion in the form of data extortion whatever it might be 
I, I love the fact that it gives you the ability to kind of take time back as your advantage as well. Let's keep on this thread a little bit here. And Huxley, I'm gonna to come to you first on this one. Uh, in, in what ways does that kind of open and API driven nature, especially as we're talking about here from the SecOps cloud platform perspective, help facilitate like a seamless integration? We've talked about, and you specifically mentioned, multiple tools that do one thing but do it very well. I'm kind of taking the opposite approach to not one tool does everything. So I'm gonna look at things that do things well. Mm -hmm. How does like open and API driven nature facilitate that again that seamless integration how does it make it interoperable i mean are we just connecting the dots here or well i think i think there's a response here to a trend uh, in security where there's this rise of security engineering right where more and more defenders are knowing how to code right there's, there's somebody i spoke to recently uh she's uh, an, an ir lead and she said i asked her these days, is it true that basically every single defender needs to know how to code? She says, either you need to know Python or you have to be really, really good at, at Excel. So take your pick of, <laughs> yeah. of poison there. So the thing is, like with all these developers or uh, de development aware security engineers out there, you want to enable them to be able to self-serve a lot of this stuff. And, and having that open API allows them to do that. If you're giving them a lot of hoops to jump through just to be able to, you know, figure out what the API endpoint is they need to talk to, like, that's not really helping anybody, right? So having that open architecture allows the customer to self-serve and, and innovate on their own and, and not be hampered by you, you know, the, the vendor to, to, for, for their defense. I like that's it. really hey, John, hey, what do you got, John? It's really funny that you say either Excel or Python because uh, one of our founders, Owen Hinchy, uh, says that he built the platform with the accessibility of Excel in mind, but the power of code, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely spot on there. Um, what I kind of like look for in a, uh, like API driven platforms is like easy and like well-known authentication mechanisms. That's always kind of been our, um, our biggest barrier to like get up and going like, you know, in organizations, authentication and access to tools can, can definitely be, um, a struggle sometimes, but when you have like good, well thought out uh, authentication mechanisms, and then um, you know good documentation and just uh, easy to digest like ways to get started with the platform, I find that to be really helpful. Um, and then to top it all off, when organizations kind of start thinking, uh, or when vendors start thinking through their creation of their tools uh, in a multi-tenant um, fashion, I, I find that to be like really really helpful as well. Uh, to be able to access like maybe a management tenant from MSSP or something like that. And then also be able to access, um, have like a trust uh, between that MSSP and, and the other uh, customer tenants. Um, I think that goes a long way in just uh, being able to put the right people in the right place to solve problems. Absolutely. Casey, anything to add on? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you mentioned it earlier, but just, you know, keeping tempo and being able to answer those questions and being able to pivot between tools or enrich data in a single tool. Like if you're investigating endpoint, eventually you're gonna have to maybe hit a proxy. You may have to go hit other resources and having these integrations that you can right click or, or have already been pre-built and thought through, uh, just make teams go faster uh, and, and close that loop. So yeah, 100%. I like it. I think you guys are hitting right on the, really the, like the, the, key, the key takeaway, the key, the key phrase here which is how do we make the experience of securing an environment easier and better for defenders that are out there? You know, I've noticed that at no point in time are we thinking to ourselves like, oh, this is a way I could sell more things, whatever that thing might yeah. be. We're talking about ways to, to recognize the maturity of the, of the security analysts that are out there and say, how can we make life a little bit easier for them as well? Speaking of which, you know, I, I think what this does is it also introduces another concept here about the SecOps cloud platform, uh, enhancing really like that, that, that overall market reach and visibility for vendors because it gives a centralized platform for solutions to be showcased. And I'm curious, you guys, you, Casey, I'll come to you first because you guys are ones that we've done integrations with over at Things, and it's been a huge benefit for us to be able to say, here's Lima Charlie, by the way, we've got the ability to add this thing on and that centralized approach gives us the ability to say to our customers, hey, here's a thing you might not have thought about before. And then vice versa, you get the ability to say, hey, here's a relationship you might not have thought about before. Any thoughts on how this type of platform, how this approach can enhance that market reach? 
Well, I think we hit on it a little bit earlier, but just having having the APIs and having generalized access, like webhooks, very common. I mean, those type of things. People people want to be able to get the data from their their from our platform into their platform because then they have that extra context where they can see like a things to alert, and then you meld that in a, a timeline with the other Lima Charlie telemetry from say other sources. So. Uh, I, I think having that as vendor, vendors should provide that or expose that uh, endpoint and be prepared for it. If they don't have it today, they're going to miss out, right? So have being prepared for um, being able to pull or push the data to people. If that answers the question, that's kind of what I was thinking about is just having that the plumbing in place to snap it together. It's just going to make your customer's experience much better as you work with other products. So yeah, yeah our team's thought a lot about that and. Having a good, well-documented API helps teams do that. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would add that, um, you know, not just a desire, more than a desire, there are many customers where uh, the ability to interoperate is now required, right? Yep. They'll, they'll put that on the RFP and they'll say, listen, I love your tool, I love what it does, but that doesn't necessarily mean I want that to be my system of engagement. I still like using my other tool over here as my main console for whatever. And so they're gonna say, Love the tool, but you better be working, interoperating with everything else that I have over here so that I'm minimizing the amount of, of, of training or onboarding that I have to do with my own team who are so busy that they don't necessarily have the time to go learn the ins and outs of your console, right? So it's, it's become a requirement, not just not just a, a nice to have. Yeah, absolutely. John, uh, you... speaking of centralized platform and plumbing in place, <laughs> yeah. Casey and Huxley set up a perfect tee for you. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, so so Tynes is great at being the glue is like what we like to call it uh, between a lot of different solutions. And uh, the more that like a single platform can offer us data and the more that we can pull, uh, the more ability that we have to like create creative solutions. Um, I would even go a little bit farther than just the product uh, element of this. Um, I think what's really unique about all of our platforms here is like we all fully embrace the community and being able to offer solutions to people that uh, might not be able to spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a solution. And when you start getting together vendors that embrace those kind of ethos beyond just the product, uh, you, you start to really create uh, really cool solutions for just anybody out there. Speaking of anybody out there, I was gonna ask next, what, uh, how do we think the SecOps Cloud Platform enables the cybersecurity professionals out there? to leverage core capabilities and automate those actions. So guys, I think you've talked very well about the product. Um, Huxley, you talked about it being a requirement about companies looking for it. So let's go, not products working together, but professionals working with these types of different products. How does this type of approach enable them to be stronger, be more empowered, be faster, or perhaps just say, hey, now I've got the best tools at my hand? Um, so when somebody gives you a bunch of Python, it's it's not a, a foregone conclusion that you, you you can read their code and know what it's doing right right off the top of your head right like the, there's going to be some learning there when you're taking over somebody else's code if you've ever maintained anybody else's code you know what I'm talking about right <laughs> uh, but if something's packaged up in a platform then more likely you could take that and just sort of reuse that right it, it depends on the platform of course but it's more likely to be the case. I like it. I think that's a, a really good takeaway or not takeaway, but a really good point of focus as well is I'm not giving you the underlying plumbing, Casey. I, I really like the term plumbing that you used earlier. I'm not giving you the underlying plumbing here and then telling you go build it and good luck, right? We're taking it an extra step or two further. So that way you can actually make use of it and then put those final pieces in together. I, I, I really like this approach here. Speaking of which, we've got all of us sitting here talking through this. How do you think this platform supports collaboration and partnership opportunities between vendors? And I think what we're doing here is really talking about a mutually beneficial ecosystem for all of us. We're not in a competitive state. We're talking about working together. Yeah, well, uh, I have to be friends with everybody because Tynes connects to everything or has to connect to everything and we have to create a solution uh, for everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm well past the competitive nature of, of the whole industry, uh, I, I think, everybody is going to bring their own individual tool stack that they think is right for their organization. And, uh, you know, the, 
greatest benefit that I've seen to companies is making sure that their vendors are working together to make them successful. And when you get like that special magic happening, uh, the, the organization there, they know the ins and outs of what they're trying to protect and the vendors know the ins and outs of their product. Um, we can't expect everybody to know like the products, uh, to the same degree that the vendors do. And so when you have vendors working collaboratively to come up with good solutions and, and bring those to, uh, two companies, then I think really powerful things um, can happen. And I think it shares, it showcases in a way what different capabilities are. Like at any given moment, a defender has to context switch between data sources. So am I looking at Endpoint? Am I looking at Azure? Am I looking at AWS logs? Am I trying to do asset discovery or mapping? So you start to see, they may be answering one question today, but then when you have a marketplace or you have a place where people can see the data streams, see the data sources and tie those back to say an incident. So you could take something like solar winds and break it down and say, Hey, these are the data sources that would have been helpful. This is how you can integrate them in the platform and not present just one, but you could, you have a marketplace where you could say, here's 12 things that have that insight or that altitude to look at the data and people can start to make decisions and people can post community. Like they can share queries, they can share uh, integrations uh, in a collaborative way that helps everybody get better because as these incidents unfold, people have different or incomplete pictures of it, but having a community platform where people can say, oh, well, I don't have, I don't have that vendor, but I need that data source or I need, I need that way to collect that data. And they could do that in advance of an incident by just looking at the marketplace or looking at examples, blogs, those type of things. That's kind of how I think about it. I like it. I like that setup. So let's look at the other side of this. Now, uh, we've talked about ways it can be successful and power analysts and power organizations, bring the best data to the table, uh, make it much more, much more accessible for folks to get an advantage on adversaries and protecting their environment. Let's go the other route of that coin. What do you think are some of the potential challenges or considerations that vendors may face when integrating with the SecOps cloud platform? And then maybe what are some thoughts on how to potentially address these? So it's kind of a two-parter, but if anyone wants to jump in, we've got a lot of really good question there. I think one challenge is going to be the noise, right? With any type of integration and 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 tuning, uh, you know, how, how are you how are analysts going to make sure that they see what they need to see and not just get alert fatigue? So I think that's always something to be aware of at, with any types of integrations or any type of uh, bringing data together. That's kind of the first thing that comes to my mind. I would add data sovereignty, right? Because okay. we're transferring data all over the place, and sometimes there are certain jurisdictions where. Some things are okay to send, some things are not okay to send. Uh, I think the solution there is that all the vendors need to be transparent about like the type of information that's being sent over the wire and what's in there and what's not in there and things like this. Mm -hmm. A lot of what I deal with in like day to day is just knowing what is possible and like what solutions are out there that can be solved for, right? We uh, deal with a lot of alerts. We deal with a lot of the same kind of manual repetitive work uh, out there. And honestly, sometimes it's hard to imagine how like these things could be automated or how uh, you could integrate solutions together in order to solve your problems. And so a lot of the time, it, to me, it's uh, really focused on like thinking creatively about problems and seeing how, how can I actually like fit together a couple solutions to solve this um, once and for all. I think you guys all hit on, on excellent points there. I'd, I'd maybe add one on if, uh... If, if it maybe bolsters what you also said as well as which is the, also that step of openness of being ready and available to say I'm going to be delivering something in a way that I maybe haven't delivered before um, and I'm not asking for a change of business process but more of an alignment with where the industry seems to be going where the industry is headed towards what the developers the developing security analysts want the developing security tool crea creators what they want and what they're looking for and making that available to them so very, very valuable insight there. Well, I will say from a Lima Charlie perspective, everyone here has successfully integrated with the SecOps cloud platform in one way, shape or form. Do you guys have any examples of ways that the, or different benefits that you see or things that you've seen from an integration that have felt a little bit new or perhaps maybe changed the game for some pr customers out there? But I can start, I think with ours, you know, one that we did was a Canary token integration 
And I think seeing that data in the stream of other data was really powerful, right? So like the idea is like a canary alert is really just the beginning of an incident for most folks. And so seeing that integration where they could now take that alert, figure out who accessed the document from which endpoint and, and, and those type of things, to me, that was really cool to see. Uh, I think that will help people. Um, you know, I think that's true of other products like that enrichment or seeing the, the data in the context of other products, maybe. Yeah. Mm. All right. Go ahead, Huxley. Oh, so for those who are not familiar with Run Zero, we have this capability of, of helping customers get to a, a full asset inventory. And how this works with Lean to Charlie is probably one of our most popular value props for customers, which is making sure that there's coverage with a certain technology or solution that you want. So in this case, Lima Charlie. So if you want to make sure that you have Lima Charlie uh, on as many endpoints as possible, how do you know what everything is? How do you know what you're missing? Well, that's where that full asset inventory comes in. And it, it is one of the, our, our most important value props, most popular ones uh, among our customers. Yeah, and for Tynes, you know, it really starts with, can you handle the alerts, your detections coming off, off of Lima Charlie, uh, the rules that you create uh, in Lima Charlie? Um, that's usually where people start off pretty pretty immediately. But then we have uh, a bunch of really cool capabilities like being able to orchestrate commands across, like running uh, remote commands across your fleet, uh, be able to like do forensics, grab forensic information really easily and bring that into a, a platform that pretty much anybody can utilize uh, really quickly and easily to when incidents occur, respond quickly. Um, and something that we're looking for uh, exploring pretty soon is, you know, being able to run searches across data, uh, across many different, uh, you know, that kind of sim like functionality where you can query your data, be able to get results and know, uh, what's happening in your environment. Um, really excited to see, uh, see that come here, uh, shortly. I love it. And I'll say just on behalf of everyone here, we, we love being integrated with the three of you as well, cause it's a, an awesome ecosystem and a great part of the collaboration to have here. Uh, speaking of which. Let's look in the future a little bit. How do we think the relationship between the SecOps cloud platform and cybersecurity vendors is going to evolve? And maybe what are your thoughts on different opportunities or advancements that we'll see in the future? Yeah, I'm, I'm John, already you, just... Hey, you, you, you get to go first. <laughs> I, yeah, I've been around Lima Charlie for so many years now um, and you know, working with uh, the organization and starting from just a EDR to now being a data platform to being a cloud platform, like a security uh, console cloud platform, right? Um, it's just been shocking to like see the growth and the... the um, honestly, just like I, I didn't think... The, the, all of that was possible, right? And so it's been incredible to see where the platform has kind of gone. Um, I think, you know, just working across more organizations, being able to deploy faster, being able to deploy um, with, you know, fewer resources uh, that need to know everything about anything. Um, that's really where I see kind of like things going just in general across the industry and uh, partnering with folks that understand that um, I, we'll get us all ahead. I like it. All right. Last but not least, what opportunities do you think we're going to see from the managed security space? And in this, I'm going to include MSSPs, MSPs, MDRs to leverage the evolving capabilities of the SecOps cloud platform to expand service offerings and address emerging challenges in that rapidly changing threat landscape. And I think all of you have examples of a way that technology that maybe previously didn't coexist, it now can easily coexist and allow new service offerings, new developments. I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, well, coming from a background of a, working at an MSSP, um, it, it was very much, you know, some processes had to be done manually, some processes uh, had to be, like tickets had to be reviewed, we had to put eyes and we had to put knowledge, uh, like human knowledge towards many alerts and many things that came in, uh, because it's just so varied. There's just so many tools out there. What I'm seeing progress very quickly though, is adopting more technologies, integrating with more customer tools, responding faster, uh, being able to get reach out to, uh, customer resources in order for context, additional context faster to be able to respond faster. Uh, I think the MSP and, and MDR space is just evolving so rapidly. Um, and I think by embracing tools like Lima Charlie and 
uh, other other things that really facilitate this easy deployment and easy data retrieval, um, those companies are going to really see the benefits quickly. For me, it's it's about meeting the customers where they are and supporting them in the way they want to consume these security solutions, right? Not every company can afford to have a massive SOC or a large security team. They have to rely on their trusted advisors, their MSSPs, to get that done. And any sort of efficiencies that an MSSP can have by leveraging our platform and these best of breed tools ultimately benefits the, the, the end customer. So, you know, it, it helps us as, as the end vendor too, to, to work through these MSSPs. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think you're going to see in terms of emerging or how these organizations can take advantage of it. I think you'll see kind of to Huxley's point, people don't, people have to rely on these partnerships. So you could expose stuff and say, Hey, look, we've seen, we're starting to see attacks across the network against exchange servers. And we noticed, you know, we could, we've seen that you have this exchange server that's at this patch level. So like that data, you could sort of help give them a nudge or tip off where they didn't even know they had exposure or, you know, I just use that as an example, but there could be other situations where they may not even be aware of a situation and you could raise it for them early or even remediate it, right? So, hey, we took this action. We went ahead and did this thing, automated it. Uh, if you have questions or problems, let us know. But I think you'll start to see, hopefully, uh, these vendors, MDR, MSSP, anticipate, and an organization may miss it. So if something's happening at 3 a.m. and you're up there already taking action uh, on networks in the U.S. now or something. So I, that's something I, I'm excited about to see because these are teams that are part-time. They can't take those actions. And so to the degree we can take the insight we get in Lima Charlie or, or, or these integrations and then help people make faster decisions or fixes. Maybe that's something I see emerging. It's funny, the four of us talk from a very damaged background of slow tools, lack of data integration, and just hurdles over hurdles over hurdles just to answer a question. And I'm glad that we're all able to see like, no, it's this, is, this problem is starting to go away. It's great. Yep. Awesome. All right, guys, that was our, our last and final question. Uh, Chris, you're back on. Thanks for having spent this time with us. Uh, we were really excited to share this vision of the SecOps Cloud Platform with you. And hopefully you are as happy to see, and it's a breath of, a breath of fresh air for you as well. Uh, we're really excited to keep building and, uh, and make great things for you to use in the future. If you're interested in the vision that we've put forward and what we've built, please get in touch with us. Uh, we work with people from all kinds of different aspects of, aspects of cybersecurity, whether it's people running security operations or building products or you know developing new threat intelligence. We're just excited to be working with everybody in the industry. Now, we're also engineers at Lima Charlie. And uh, what that means is that... It, we feel that, you know, any opportunity like this to be talking to a lot of people, we kind of want to expose something interesting that, uh, that we're about to release, get, give a little bit of a, uh, of a preview. So today, we're happy to announce that we will be rolling out what we call BinLib. So BinLib is a feature for Leah Charlie. As everything that we do, it means that it's designed to be working as part of all of the other features of the SecOps Cloud Platform and not as a single product silo. Binlib itself is a private repository of binaries that have ever executed within your environment. This means that it gives you an incredible aperture for you to search through metadata that is related to all things having executed in your environment, to run Yara scans at scale on this data. Obviously, you can kind of gather from it that the, the real big use cases and value propositions are around being able to do retro retroactive investigation to determine if you have been affected by a specific uh, threat actor in the past or to try to connect the dots as part of an incident between uh, different pieces of malware that, that might have been used throughout your environment. So this is going to be a very powerful feature, 
And the fact that it's built as a feature in a SecOps cloud platform way means that we will be working with people in that are generating threat intelligence, um, that are generating integrations and product so that they can just leverage that from day zero as part of their stack and their solutions and their operations. So this is this binlib is going to be uh, is currently I should say in private beta right now, so it's in the hands of people trying it uh, and having lots of funds and building cool things with it. We will be rolling it out uh, generally available at Black Hat. So in the meantime, if you're interested in uh, kicking the tires or you have ideas of things that you want to build with it. Um, or you even have deployments that you want to go and start using it, get in touch with us. And you can also reach out to us uh, at Black Hat, where we'll be, and have all of those very cool conversations. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.